Hello everybody, uh, I'm back and I'm going to give you guys a lesson today on an important and a fundamental topic to geotechnical engineering. It's the topic of PQ diagrams and stress paths. Um, th this concept has been a very useful and helpful concept for geotechnical engineers over the decades and um, it once you grasp it you begin to use stress paths um, frequently and uh, they're very very useful but they, uh, there's a little learning curve to uh, climb in order to learn how to use them now I apologize for all the background noise I'm actually traveling today and uh, I'm in the lounge here at the airport and so um, hopefully you can hear my voice okay but I know that there's people talking around me so just try to block them out and listen to my voice so um, let's just dive in and, and talk a little bit about the basics of stress paths first. <clears throat> so the idea with stress paths is um, finding a more efficient way to represent the loading history on a particular element of soil. So when I say an element of soil, what I mean is I've got some element that has stresses acting on it. Uh, there could be shear stresses, there could uh, not be shear stresses, but the point is that uh, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to track how those stresses are changing um, and, and then uh, track the overall st external stresses acting on that soil element. So the way that we do that is with all of these different Mohr circles. So um, now when you draw lots of Mohr circles, they can get really messy in a hurry. And uh, as engineers, we're, we're always looking for ways to be more efficient. And so uh, we learned that we could take a shortcut. If, as long as we make the assumption that each one of these circles is centered around the x-axis or the sigma or the normal stress axis, then we learned that we can define uh, each one of these circles just using a single point and that's the top of the circle and that's useful because we we can obtain the radius of the circle just by the height of that point or the, the y value of that point and we also get the center coordinate of the circle so with the center coordinate of the circle and the radius of the circle we have everything we need to um, we have everything that we need to uh, to recreate the circle if we wanted to. So the radius then of that circle, the y value uh, or the the y coordinate then of each point of the top of each one of these circles becomes then a new coordinate and we're going to call that coordinate Q so again Q is just the radius of each more circle and then the center coordinate we're going to call P so this is just the center coordinate of each circle okay so now uh, if we convert then all of these circles to these points, we have, uh, f instead of four circles, now I just have four points. And the, the y coordinate again is the radius of the circle and the x coordinate is the coordinate of the center of the circle. So that's Q and that's P. Uh, the prime that you'll see here indicates that, that these circles correspond to the effective stresses on the soil element. Um, I could also have P and Q without the primes and those would correspond to the total stresses acting on my soil element. But for this diagram here, these are effective stresses. So now once I have all of those uh, P, Q points plotted out for my various more circles, um, each of these circles, by the way, represents uh, the circles at failure. So, you know, for the more cool on failure envelope, if I wanted to, I could come along and I could try to draw the envelope that is tangent to that, and that would be my uh, more Coulomb failure envelope. But if I convert everything to P and Q coordinates, then um, what I can do, what I can do is 
regress uh, an envelope through those points. Now, you understand that this failure envelope, this, this purple line here, is very different than the, um, the failure envelope for a traditional tau and sigma more coulomb space. So if I were then to redraw my failure envelope that's tangent to the circles, you'd see that that would be the failure envelope there. But now if I, uh, let me see if I can change the color. If I try to draw the failure envelope that is tangent or, or goes through the, the top of the more circles, you see that, um, I, mean, I didn't do a very good job with that. Let me see if I can redo that. Oh man, this is harder than you think, folks. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. They're not the same envelope. And and so the angle that corresponds to that envelope that goes to the top of the circles has a different angle to it, where uh, the more Coulomb failure envelope is, um, let me go back to red. The more Coulomb failure envelope has an angle of phi. This modified failure envelope has an angle of alpha. Okay, so they both represent failure envelopes. And when the more circle reaches the more Coulomb failure envelope, it fails. When the when the stress path. Uh, the PQ diagram reaches the modified failure envelope, the soil also fails. So the equation for this modified envelope is given right here, where um, Q is going to equal some y-intercept m plus p prime times the tangent of alpha. So you see that it, this is very similar to the more Coulomb failure criteria which looks something like this. Same format, same, uh, same style, but we just have different parameters. So um, now this failure envelope here has a very special name. Uh, and, and the term is, is K sub F. Now you'll recall that when we talk about a K, if I go and draw again a soil element that has vertical stresses and horizontal stresses, we know that K is simply going to be the ratio of the horizontal stresses to the vertical stresses, okay? So um, there's, there's different uh, there's different K's. We have K alpha or I'm sorry, Ka, which is the active condition. We have K0, which is the at-risk condition. We have Kp, which is a passive failure condition. Now, this Kf represents the ratio that corresponds to um, shear failure, okay? And KF can be analogous to K active or K passive, just depending on which side of the axis you're on, if you're above the sigma axis or below the sigma axis. And in this lesson, you're going to see what I'm talking about. But just know that that failure envelope represents the K values or the, the K ratio that corresponds to shear failure, okay? So, uh, this figure, I think, is a better representation that shows uh, how the traditional more Coulomb failure envelope compares with our modified failure envelope. So, uh, as you can see, the more circles can change, 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 and as those circles change, meaning that the stresses on our soil element are changing, we can we, whoops, I want to end the show. We can follow that path of the tops of the circles. So you can see there's kind of arrows here that indicate that it's, it's really a moving line. And that's why we call it a stress path. So as that line moves, once that line reaches the KF line or the modified failure envelope, it corresponds to the exact moment that the Mohr circle reaches the traditional 
um, more Coulomb failure envelopes. So they both touch the failure envelopes at the same time, which means that they're really analogous. They're, they're not the same thing, but they both represent similar conditions. They represent failure of the soil. So when I say that they're analogous, what I'm really meaning is that if we know alpha and m, we can calculate phi and c and vice versa. So we can do that using these equations right here. So this is how we convert back and forth between the two methods, okay? So uh, this figure diagrams uh, just an example of what a stress path would look like in a consolidated drained test. So in, remember, in a consolidated drain test, you can see that um, sigma 3, this is again, here's my soil element, I have sigma 1, and then I have sigma 3 on the side. The cell pressure doesn't change in a consolidated drain test, and so that's going to remain constant. That implies that all of these more circles have the same sigma 3 coordinate. It doesn't change, but what changes is sigma 1. Sigma 1, it, it's sigma 1 is just increasing as we increase the deviator stress. So as we increase the deviator stress, our Mohr circle gets larger and larger and larger, and we can follow the stress path as it moves and moves and moves and begins to approach this uh, KF line, this modified failure envelope, until it eventually reaches the modified failure envelope that corresponds at the same time the Mohr circle reaches the traditional Mohr Coulomb failure envelope, and then we get failure of the soil. Uh, and so anytime we do a consolidated drain test, the, uh, the, the stress path is going to go up and to the right at a degree of 45 degrees, or an angle of 45 degrees. Now what about a CU test? Uh, when we have a CU test, we have a, 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 an interesting phenomenon because uh, because the the test is undrained, there's going to be pore pressure generation, and so as we as we have pore pressure generation, the pore pressure can be either positive for um, an A bar material. That's the Skempton. Uh, pore pressure parameter A, or it could be negative for a dilative material where A bar is, is negative. So uh, if it's A bar is positive, we have a contractive soil of A bar is negative, we have a dilative soil, uh, and those correspond directly to the pore pressures that are generated. And of course we know that effective stress equals total stress minus the pore pressure. So if I have a change in pore pressure, it's going to affect that pore pressure and the effective stress. The point being, I could draw more circles in terms of the stresses that I'm actually applying to the soil in my, in my triaxial test, or I could shift that circle. I can translate it by uh, the pore pressure that I'm measuring inside of my uh, test, inside the soil of, the, of my test, to develop effective stress more circles. Okay, So I could draw stress paths in terms of total stresses or uh, effective stresses. If I draw stress paths in terms of total stresses, it's going to look just like it did in the uh, CD triaxial test where this line is going to increase at an angle of 45 degrees. But that's no guarantee of what the effective stress path is going to do. We often call that the ESP. So I have the TSP for total stress path and I have the ESP for the effective stress path. Uh, the effective stress path can do whatever the heck it wants to because it's going to be dictated by whatever the change in the pore pressure is in my soil. And that's going to deter be determined whether or not my soil is contractive or dilative or something in between. Between. So um, the direction that my effective stress path takes is really what's going to govern the behavior of my soil. When the effective stress path reaches the, the failure envelope, 
that's when I get sheer failure in my soil. As far as the total stress, uh, the total stress path, it it really doesn't matter. It doesn't it doesn't matter what that envelope reaches because all we care about is the effective stress path. So um, this this figure here demonstrates that idea. So we what we have here are effective stress paths and general undrained response of different types of soil. So I have uh, diagrammed here two stress paths. I have one stress path, effective stress path that goes this way, and I have one effective stress path that goes this way. And they correspond, by the way, to a total stress path that's going in this direction and a total stress path that's going in this direction. Now, how do I get my stress pass to go that way? Now, think about the more circles. How would you get the more circles to move in those directions? Well, first of all, if uh, I have a soil that is... Um, if I have a total stress path in this direction at an angle of 45 degrees, that's really going to correspond to an A bar material of zero. That means that there, uh, the change in pore pressure equals zero. It's neither dilative nor contractive. It's essentially drained. Okay, so this is the same total stress path that I would get from a consolidated drained test. Uh, for this condition, where the the uh, stress path would go straight up, this would correspond to an A bar of 0 0.5. So in, in this particular case, uh, I have a contractive soil, but uh, a marginally contractive soil. So in other words, the pore pressure, uh, remember A bar, by the way, is the ratio of the change in pore pressure to the change in um, deviator stress from uh, my my triaxial testing. So what this is saying is for every uh, 100 kPa of stress I'm applying to the soil from my from my ram and my triaxial device, I'd be getting 50% of that in pore pressure response. So for 100 kPa, I'd be getting 50 kPa. That's what A bar of, of 0 0.5 would mean. Uh, for this line over here on the left, this would be an A bar of 1, meaning that now I have a very contractive soil, and for every change in uh, deviator stress, that deviator stress is completely being uh, reacted to and and equal to by the change in the pore pressure so that would be an a bar of one now i can get a bars values uh less than zero negative a bar down in in this territory okay uh, this would mean then that i would have a dilative soil if my um, stress paths go down in that direction so wherever my effective stress path goes tells me whether the soil is dilative, really dilative, a little contractive, really contractive. It all depends on uh, the direction of, of the stress path. In general, if my stress path goes to the left, I have a contractive soil. Okay. If my stress path goes to the right, I have a dilative soil. I mean, that's, that's pretty much the, the rule to follow there, okay? And if my stress path, though, follows this path of A bar equals zero, I have a drained soil where I don't have any pore pressure response. Okay, and uh, yeah, similar to what I talked about with A bar less than zero, if I am down in this range where my... Uh, effective stress paths are down here this is where I have sensitive or even quick soils or collapsible soils so when a bar is greater than one that's implying that the pore pressure response is greater than my change in deviator stress so the soil is collapsing um, 
And that's, that's a pretty dangerous place to be if you're an engineer. So the, the location and the path of the effective stress path will correspond directly to Skempton's pore pressure parameter, the A parameter. So a couple of things to think about uh, for stress paths of soil in the real world, if I have sedimented soils, uh, essentially the stress path of a soil element as it's deposited in the field is going to follow um, a path like this, the stress path, where it corresponds to K0. And K0, of course, is usually going to be on the order around uh, 0.5 or so. Okay, so remember that's the ratio of the horizontal stress to the vertical stress. So it's going to follow that, that path. Um, it ranges, like uh, prof Professor Bob Holt says, anywhere from 0.5 to up to 0.8 or 0.9, but it usually hovers around 0.5. Now, if I were to go and sample soil, like I was to drill a hole and try to get a sampler down there, what I'm really doing is I'm unloading the stress on top of that soil. So by unloading that that stress, I start to reduce my sigma 1, and by reducing my sigma 1, my stress path might follow a path down here. If I eventually get to the point where the horizontal stresses are equal to the vertical stresses, I could reach this point on the hydrostatic line, and we call it the hydrostatic line because K equals 1, meaning the horizontal stress equals the vertical stress. And that's usually right on the p-axis. So, so that uh, would correspond uh, to, think of the soil element that's now exposed to atmosphere. The stresses acting on the side are equal to the stresses on the top. It's just, it's just a, a block of soil sitting uh, exposed to the atmosphere. Um, that's the stress path that I would take. Now, um, it's possible that this stress path can actually go past that and come down here into negative territory. Um, this would be the case uh, of, of natural geologic phenomenon as, as is described in this paragraph here. So in other words, let's say that uh, due to natural geologic phenomena, the soil is unloaded through erosion or the melting of a glacier or something like that. If, if that's the case, then that stress path can go well below that hydrostatic line and we can end up down here. So now, if we're down here, the horizontal stress, the horizontal stress is greater than the vertical stress. And if, if that's uh, the case, then um, we have uh, an over-consolidated soil. So anytime our stress path drops below the p-axis, we end up in the, the area of over-consolidation. Okay. So, yeah, uh, this is a good time to maybe pause and, and just think about this for a little bit and think about where... Uh, what that means for the stress path to drop below the p-axis uh, and how that implies that the horizontal stress is larger than the vertical stress. Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about the total stress paths for a moment. Uh, the total stress paths are indicative of the the type of loading that we're applying to our soil element or to our soil um, specimen. So these are the stresses like in a triaxial test that, that we're applying. So let's, let's look at the total stress pass in an isotropic triaxial testing. Now remember, isotropic means that the horizontal stresses are equal to the vertical stresses um, it, during consolidation, okay? <laughs> So that means then that instead of having a circle initially, we have a point on the K1 line. 
So there's my initial point. Now, once I start shearing the total stress path, now the sigma three is, is going to stay constant at that point, and then the more circle is either going to go this way or um, depending on what I do, if I, if I maintain the ram constant and, uh, um, and, and I drop the cell pressure, then it's going to go that way. Or, uh, you know, there's different ways to load this. And the direction that the total stress path goes really determines the type of loading that I have. So, for this example and what I'm showing here, Let's note something. Note that, that if the horizontal stress changes from sigma 3 to sigma 1, that, that means that the horizontal stresses become larger than the vertical stresses. Uh, and that means then that the stress path is going to drop below the P axis and um, Q is going to become negative. So that's where we get down into the, you know, down below the axis down there, uh, corresponding to line F. Okay, so let's, let's have a look at these different paths. So path A, this path right here, if this is the path that we take, this implies that uh, any whole change in the horizontal stress is going to equal a change in the vertical stress. So this would correspond to isotropic consolidation. So this would be like us um, cranking the cell pressure but leaving the drains open so that the soil just keeps getting squished equally in all directions and it can still remain drained. So that would be the stress path uh, for that condition. Let's look at uh, path B. So a path B here at 18.4 degrees, that implies then that um, any increase in the horizontal stress on our soil is going to equal one half the increase in our vertical stress. So the horizontal stress is increasing faster than the vertical stresses. Path C, it's our magic number of 45 degrees. This implies that the horizontal stress is not increasing at all and the only increase is happening uh, in the vertical stress. So this would be like a triax test. For line D, any increase in the horizontal stress is equal to a negative increase in the vertical stress. So in other words, if we start as a point, our circles are just going like this. So it almost looks like a spider's web, right? So that's what we would see in like a... Um, a direct simple shear test. For stress path E, where it's at uh, 45 degrees going the other way, then we say that uh, for this case, the vertical stress is not changing, but the horizontal stress is decreasing. So our more circle is just going in this direction like this, okay? And then for stress path F, this corresponds for an increase in our horizontal stress, uh, our vertical stress is decreasing. So think of it like this, that instead of our circles going like that, our circles have inverted and now they're going like this, okay? So remember, anytime we're down below the, the p-axis, our vertical stresses are larger than our, our, I'm sorry, our horizontal stresses are larger than our vertical stresses. But what if we don't have isotropic consolidation, or if we have anisotropic consolidation? So if that's the case, then our initial uh, circle that we start from is going to be something like this. 
where um, maybe this is sigma vertical and that's sigma horizontal, or they could be switched. Maybe this is sigma vertical and this is sigma horizontal. The point is that um, the initial stress state on our soil, um, sigma V, the vertical stress, is not equal to the horizontal stress. So if that's the case, then we have um, an anisotropic condition. And we still see the same trends. We still see stress pass. They go off in whatever direction they're going to go, as described here. But they just have a different starting point. Instead of starting on the isotropic K equals 1 line, they might start on the K naught line or whatever we want to, whatever, uh, uh, whatever line of K that we want to initially start them on, okay? So, this is a very important slide and I want you guys to memorize this behavior that's shown here. So this is a this is a famous picture from Holtz and Kovacs and it's uh, actually taken after Lamb from 1987 and this is showing stress pass during drained loadings on normally consolidated clays. The thing that I want you to understand is the the direction of uh, the uh, the stress path is indicative of the type of loading that's going on okay that's the thing to take from this this slide right here so uh, what I want to point out here is if I have a stress path that goes up and to the right like this, it's always going to correspond to axial compression. If I have a stress path that goes up and to the left in that direction, it's always going to correspond to lateral extension. If I have a stress path that goes down and to the left, it's always going to correspond to axial extension. And if I have a stress path that goes down and to the right like that, it's always going to correspond to lateral compression. So um, here's some examples of each of those conditions. So you can see how useful a stress path is because based on the direction of the stress path, we know the type of loading that's going on in the soil. Or conversely, if we know the type of loading, we know the direction that the stress path is going to go. Um, and, and I want to point out that for drained loading, the total stress path is going to equal the effective stress path. If, uh, if it's undrained loading, those paths could deviate. The total stress path could go, for instance, up and to the right, but the effective stress path could go and, and deviate to the left. Um, it all depends on the pore pressure response. So uh, for undrained loading, there's, here's the typical stress pass. If I have a, a normally consolidated versus over consolidated clays, or another way would be like loose versus very dense sands. For normally consolidated clay or for loose sand, The Skempton pore pressure parameter at failure is always going to be positive. It's going to be greater than zero, indicating that our change in pore pressure is positive. Okay. For highly over consolidated clays or for dense sands, that A parameter, the Skempton A parameter, is going to be negative. It's going to be less than zero. And that's going to imply that the change in our pore pressure is going to be negative. So for uh, the loose sands, the change in pore pressure is positive. 
uh, and also for the normally consolidated clay. For the highly over consolidated clay or the dense sands, that change in pore pressure is going to be negative. And that's going to correspond then, those, those positive and negative pore pressures are going to change the effective stress. So the change in effective stress, if I have an increase in pore pressure, is going to be a decrease in effective stress. And if I have a negative change in pore pressure, that's going to increase my effective stress. So positive pore pressures are going to move the effective stress path to the left, okay? They're going to curve and go to the left, while negative pore pressures are going to make the effective stress path go to the right. They're going to increase effective stresses. So it's going to look something like this. So here's my total stress path right here, okay? And it's an axial compression, just like a normal triax test, but this is an undrained test. So this implies that there's going to be a change in pore pressure. If my change in pore pressure is positive, that means that my effective stresses um, are going to go down. So that means that my effective stress path is going to start to deviate from my total stress path and it's going to move to the left and it's going to move by the change in pore pressure at that particular point in the test and it's going to keep doing that until the effective stress path eventually reaches the failure envelope the kf line and that's when my soil reaches failure okay now, here's another figure that I, I want to show you. Um, oh, and I should point out that this, the test started on this K0 is less than one line, so that implies it's anisotropic consolidation. Had the test started on uh, this point right here, this corresponds to the K equals one line, so that would be isotropic. Just again, it's good to get these uh, to understand those concepts. So this would be an anisotropic consolidation. So the positive pore pressure decreased the effective stress and it caused the effective stress path to move to the left. In this example, I have a, um, a dilative soil. So that could be a, a highly uh, over, oops. That could be a, a highly over-consolidated clay or a dense sand. So in, in this particular instance, again, my total stress path is going up and to the, to the right at, at 45 degrees. But look what happens to my effective stress path. Initially, it goes to the left meaning that there was some positive pore pressure generated. But as I continued to shear it, that pore pressure changed and there was a phase transformation and now this effective stress path started going to the right, meaning that now uh, the change in pore pressure was negative. I started developing negative pore pressures, which were increasing my effective stress. Effective stress has started going up. So once my e effective stress path reaches the failure envelope, then my soil fails. Notice in this instance that the total stress path is above the failure envelope. And that just goes to show you that we don't care what the total stress path does. That it does not define or govern the soil behavior in any way. The only thing that matters is the effective stress path of the soil. Another thing to point out, again, this is anisotropic consolidation down here. Notice that the soil is on um, some K0 line down here, but it, it's below the P axis, which means that it was consolidated in such a way anisotropically that the horizontal stress was greater than the vertical stress. So that's why it's down below the P axis. So that's what a di the stress path of a dilative soil would look like. So in this instance, we have negative pore pressures that result in an increase in our effective stress, and that's going to move the effective stress path to the right of the total stress path. 
So, uh, you know, all of these conditions apply to different loading conditions in the lab, but how does that relate to loading conditions in the field? Uh, I love this figure from Holtz and Kovacs, and they show some different loading conditions. So, for instance, uh, for this uh, case A, the foundation loading, this is a, an instance of axial compression. So that would be uh, a stress path up and to the right. In this instance here, where we have a retaining wall and the retaining wall is rotating out, so thus we have a decrease in the lateral stress while the vertical stress is uh, staying the same. So uh, with a decrease in the lateral stress while the vertical stress stays the same, we have lateral extension. So I believe uh, that's going to be, uh, let's see, horizontal stress moves through, that's going to be up and to the right like that. Uh, for this instance where we have a foundation that's being unloaded, the vertical stress is going down because we're removing stress, but the horizontal stress is staying the same. So for this instance, uh, this is going to be a stress path that goes down and to the left. And uh, in this instance where we have a uh, maybe an anchor, a soil anchor that's getting pulled by this wall and it's getting pulled to the right, it's going to push against this soil right here and we're going to increase the horizontal stress acting on that soil element from that anchor while the vertical stress right there is going to stay the same. So in this instance, this is going to be a stress path that goes down and to the right. So you can see how all of these different loading conditions affect the path of, of, of the, or the direction of the stress path. So the goal for any geotechnical engineer is, is to try to match the stress path from the, uh, from the field of what you anticipate in the field and try to match it in the lab so that you can predict how that soil is going to behave. So it wouldn't make sense, if, for instance, if, if I'm trying to determine the shear strength of the soil uh, for the design of an anchor, but I do a triaxial test in the lab and I test axial compression. It's not going to match the stress path of the soil in the field. It would be much better to do a stress path in the lab uh, that would match lateral compression, if I possibly could. So, uh, in closing, um, Professor Bob Holtz is, is a good friend, and he was a mentor of mine, and, and I really enjoy taking classes from him at the University of Washington. Um, he told us in class one day, and I wrote this quote down, and, and because I thought it was significant, and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, he said, quote, very often in geotechnical engineering practice, if you understand the complete stress path of your problem, uh, referring to the stress path in the field, you are well along the way towards developing a solution for that problem. In other words, if you, if you know the stress path that your soil is going to take in the field, you can do your best to replicate that stress path in the lab and then you can accurately predict what the shear strength of that soil is going to be from testing. So that's all I have for this lesson for you folks and I hope that you enjoyed it and um, feel free to leave comments if you'd like uh, and I will uh, be back in class for my students. Uh, I'll be back in my office on Thursday and you guys can come see me if you have questions and, and I can answer your questions in class on Friday if you have any about this lesson. So thanks for your attention and I'll talk to you later.